Hello, hello everyone. Happy Thursday and happy release party Thursday. If y'all have been joining these every month, you might've noticed we have a cool new intro graphic that just popped up. So some exciting things there with the animation to kick things off. Always happy to be here and excited to see y'all. Um, for those of you who are new to the release parties, we do these every single month. And it is your opportunity to hear from the people who actually work on these features. So we have a few engineers coming on today to talk about various features from this month's release. And you get to ask them all your questions. So definitely drop any questions you have in the chat. I'll be monitoring that and we can get that dialogue going. So the release actually went out last Wednesday, I believe. So hopefully you've had about a week to try out some of the new features. So I would love if in the chat you could drop any of your favorite features from this month's release so we can chat about those. Um, and let's see what's going on in the chat. Um, when did these exist? I'm assuming you mean the release parties. We do these every single month. Um, generally, it's now the second Thursday of the month, so that way y'all can try out the release a little bit, and then we can bring the engineers on to chat about it. Um, Umar. We, I really hope they do a tutorial on using TFS with VS Code. That's a great point. We love hearing any sort of ideas for what you want us to see. This is definitely something we could do a standalone video on or even do for a different live stream. So definitely love hearing your suggestions there. Hello, Bavik. Xylite, there's an entire live stream for a minor VS Code update. There's no such thing as a minor VS Code update. There's always exciting things and we're gonna cover them in this release party. So just stay tuned because we are going to have some fun stuff and we have great guests today. Um, lots of highs here, VS Code party, time to get silly. It's always a great time on the release parties. So much great energy, lots of great guests. And hello, Nikhil. So excited to see the excitement in the chat. Um, if y'all have been joining these release parties, you know that we generally also kick things off with a thank you to our contributors. So that's something we can't really do without um, all of our contributors. We really have a great ecosystem of people who help us make VS Code what it is. So I would love to kind of kick things off with that thank you. So if we scroll through, these are actually in the release notes. And if you go down to the very final thank you section, we have an issue tracking to thank everyone there, various contributions to VS Code. If we scroll through, I'd love to individually call out every single one of these people, but unfortunately that's not possible. Um, to the VS Code pull request in GitHub and then the dev Chrome launcher. So if your name is on here and you're watching, thank you so much for all of your contributions. We really could not do it without you. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and bring on our first guest, who's going to be Megan. You might have recognized her from a previous release party we've had. Hey, Megan. Hey. How's it going? It's going well. Good. I'm Happy to have you on. What yeah. will you be chatting about today? So we'll be talking about terminal quick fixes, which um, if you can share my screen, yes. we have a similar concept uh, in the editor area. So you can see this light bulb appears here um, and offers some suggestions. And we have a similar thing now in the terminal that is supported by shell integration. So any shell where there is shell integration enabled, um, this is provided. So just an example, uh, let's say you're running a server and uh, it's using a port and then, you know, you forgot that you started that somewhere and you would see this error um, address already in use message. And that would typically require a bunch of steps. And in my case, I used to Google how to actually free the port um, so that I could continue with work. But in this case, you see, I just ran this terminal quick fix and then I can continue with my work, um, which is pretty neat. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, some other cool things that you can do with this are, um, let's say you mistype a git command, you can just easily run it uh, addressed like that. 
Um, and then my personal favorite sequence, I would say, is I do this almost daily. Um, I create a new branch and then I'm ready to push it. And otherwise, I would have had to copy and paste this, but I can just do this in one step. And then also just in one step, uh, open the pull request and view the code diff there. So this is so relatable because I do this all the time, especially that get push every single time. I think I do this and I'm always like, oh my gosh, okay, let me, cause I can never actually remember what it is. So you do the copy and paste This saves so much time. Yeah. I think it's such a good example of something that's, you know, seems simple, right. But it's so impactful in such a sense that it happens to everyone and everyone can relate to it. Yeah, I've definitely gotten used to this new muscle memory and it saves me so much time. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Are there any other quick fixes you'd like to show? Uh, no, those are just a few of them. I suggest just trying it out in the terminal um, when you see a light bulb, because I, I think it will save you a bunch of time like it does for me. Okay, cool. Um, and can extensions contribute to these quick fixes? So that's a great question. And it's something that's in the works this iteration to add proposed API. So extensions can contribute these, which is exciting. Yeah. Okay, cool. And so that might be able to allow people to add different quick fixes for whatever their tasks are, their common tasks might be. Yeah. So okay. uh, there are all kinds of things that an extension might want to uh, fix for a user and they can provide those via this API. Cool. Okay. So we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, someone said, how do you make the terminal look like yours? Have you done any special um, themes to customize yours? Yeah. So this is uh, using Oh My Z Shell. Cool. Okay. So it looks like James, you kind of, it looks like they're using Z Shell. So you could use Z Shell themes. Um, and then how to get terminal autocomplete like that? Um, do you want to kind of go through that again with the kind of that, that get push set upstream, how it kind of said, okay, do you want to do this command? That was just um, kind of automatic with the quick fixes, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. if they're talking about like auto complete like this, that's just built into oh my Z shell. Okay. That's an option. But if they are talking about what I've uh, just demoed, let's say check out a new branch, um, and then push. And then I'm triggering this with uh, command dot because that is what is also used in the editor area. But um, in future, I mean, actually, this can be configured. So you can set it to whatever key binding you want. Okay. Or you can actually go and click on the light bulb and then run it like this. But that is how these quick fixes work. OK, cool. So that's that's a really good kind of distinction. So there's that autocomplete that she was showing that um, she, comes with that Z shell theme she's using, but then with quick fixes, you can either do that key binding, which you can configure or just use a handy little light bulb. Yes. Cool. Okay. Um, looks like there's a couple more questions about autocomplete. So hopefully that answered your question, but if not, let me know. Um, how do you get those three dots? I'm not sure which three dots, um, Lawrence, you were talking about. So Megan, do you know? Um, if not, please clarify. They, I'm not sure if they mean command decorations like this, but these are via uh, shell integration. So just enable shell integration. Um, maybe I could um, look at the live stream. Cool. Yeah. And Lawrence, if you can follow up, if that's what you're talking about, then awesome. If not, okay. go ahead and send us another follow up to make sure that that gets covered. And so with these quick fixes, is there um, just a list like in the release notes that people can see for what's already integrated into VS Code? Yeah, it's also in our terminal docs. OK, so cool. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else you want to kind of chat about that's in the future for these quick fixes or just the terminal in general? Uh, well, this iteration, we're also moving over to using this uh, what we call code action widget in the terminal so that they editor experience and the terminal experience related to this are very much aligned. Cool. So, so kind of having that seamless. Too. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Cause if y'all have noticed, there's been a lot of um, new work kind of with that light bulb in the editor. So that'd be great to kind of see it too in the terminal. Yeah. Awesome. 
All right. Well, if there's no more questions, thank you so much, Megan. We really appreciate you coming on. Really excited to see what else is coming with the terminal. Um, those quick fixes really save so much time and they're very powerful. Um, so looking forward to kind of see how that expands. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. All right. So we have our next feature, which will be demoed by Christoph. Hello, Christoph. How are you doing? Hey, Olivia. Doing great. How about you? Good. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, sure. What will you be talking about today with us? Yeah, so I, I'm going to show you show you some of the new features that we have in Dev Containers. Oh. And well, Dev, Dev Containers, for those who don't know, um, are all about getting your development tools installed and up and running in, in a container, which you can think of as a sort of a sandbox. So you you get them installed, um, but you don't have to in them installed locally. So you don't need to pollute your local installation. It's all running inside this container that run that does run locally, but that you can later just discard. And so if you switch over to the to, uh, to my screen, I can quickly show you what I have here. So what you need actually is you need the dev containers extension, the one I'm showing here. and um, you need Docker installed. So Docker is just the tool that's going to run the containers, and Dev Containers uses that for doing so. And so what I want to show you when you have Dev the Dev Containers extension installed, you get this green um, button at the lower left corner. You click on that, you get this um, get a, a few of these uh, remote um, actions and the, the one I want to talk about is create uh, create the dev container. Right? That's really creating a dev container from scratch, meaning you don't need a local folder or a repository uh, as you previously would have. This will give you a, a, a new dev container um, that's basically empty and it's going to be you see it's going to store the files in a Docker volume, which is again like a sandbox, a local sandbox with a file system locally that you can later. But you can just discard it if you don't use it anymore, or you can, of course, also push the, the files you, you've worked on to a Git repository. So let me start that up. And that now will first of all ask which template, which dev container template you want to uh, run the dev container with. And there's a whole lot of uh, like um, tools and, and also different languages supported. I'm just going to pick the Rust dev container. Um, okay, so this is basically where you would just select the stack that you're working in. Yes, yeah. Okay. So that's yeah, that's kind of the base configuration. And then once I have picked that, here I'm also asked for the OS version I want to use. Then I'm also asked if I want to add any additional features. Features can really be like small CLIs or entire like support for for additional languages. Okay. For for now, I, I just add the GitHub CLI. Some some of you might know. Um, to work with GitHub later on. So I pick that. And then once I'm, I click OK here, it's going to write this configuration into that Docker volume I mentioned. And it's going to start Dev Container on, on top of that with the, the Rust tools and also the GitHub CLI um, pre installed. I'll just choose to trust the file I just added here. And then we, we we're looking at the, the new workspace now here, which is basically empty. There's the only thing we have here is the dev container JSON, which is the configuration file we we are <clears throat> we, we just created by picking Rust and the GitHub. Okay. CLI. So, so previously it was basically you had to have like your folder and everything and then add that dev container to it. Now you can start from scratch essentially is what this Yes, is. exactly. So that might be maybe you want to start something new or maybe you just want to experiment, mm -hmm. um, try something new out, and then this this allows you to do that, picking picking the tools you want to do that with uh, without having to install them locally. True. That's a just great point because I have not played around with Rust. So this is a great way to kind of okay, I want a Rust environment, let's spin that up. Let me quickly show you. So now, uh, when I open the terminal, you'll see the GitHub uh, CLI is available, and also Cargo, that's the uh, Rust package manager, is here. And when you look at the Dev Container JSON, maybe if, if you've seen previous Dev Container JSON, JSONs, you you might notice that this one looks remarkably simple. This is the main property here that we have is this Rust image that we reference, and Previously, we would also mention which uh, VS Code extensions and which VS Code settings we want to have 
uh, installed alongside of, of this base image that we're using. But uh, all this configuration can now actually go into the into the image itself. So it sits on the image, this, oh. this, this part of the configuration. And that has remarkably simplified the dev container JSON. Um, just to demo that, let me show you the extensions that we've installed here. So there's a list of extensions that are only installed in the dev container. So these are not affecting your local um, VS Code install. And yeah, that's just a set of Rust or Rust-related extensions um, that we're seeing here. Yeah, so given, given that, let me just quickly, uh, there's the dev container JSON. I can quickly show you that this is also already working. Um, let me use cargo to you know, just add a, a scaffold using cargo. That adds a very simple um, <clears throat> source file with with about our well-known Hello World example. And I'll just, I'll just use that to <clears throat> mention that we have um, the containers.dev website with a whole lot of uh, additional background information on the not just the dev container JSON, but also our uh, effort to, to, to specify um, dev containers in the open. And so you can learn a whole lot more um, about dev containers there. If you're interested, and now let me just also, of course, run this. I use cargo run. Then and so first usually, build and then... sorry, when, when you had added um, previously, you know, added the dev container configurations to a project, you would also get a Docker file in. So is that not necessary in this um, workflow? That's, yeah, so the that's um, okay. exactly. So previously, the Docker file would, would also reference some sort of uh, base image and then maybe add something on top. But we're slowly moving away from that because okay. that really makes the configuration much easier. Mm -hmm. And luckily, the, the, the base image can now also come with its uh, its own uh, like piece of configuration that will help get the, the dev container up and running. That's awesome. I love that, even lowering the barrier even further to kind of having this really easily configurable environment. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's that's it. That's what I wanted to show you. Cool, that looks great. Um, so I was wondering if we could kind of go back to the start. You kind of mentioned a little bit with features and templates when you were first configuring the dev container. And it looked like there was a list of what you could choose from. Is that like a pre-configured list? Is there a way that people can contribute their own features and templates? Yeah, so indeed, that, that used to be a, a pre-configured list, but um, we've, we've changed that in the past few milestones. And well, if I just open the, the website real quick, I can show you that there's, um, well, there's a whole lot of information um, here. Um, among other things, there's uh, a list of available features, but also available templates. And you can indeed now offer them yourself. Um, this is just a list. You, you would find the, the Rust template uh, in here, in this list as well. And what, but I, what I want to call out here is actually the, the link to a, um, a quick start repository. And we have the same for features as well. And this repository uh, comes with a few you know, simple examples of, of how to actually offer your own template and we have the same as i mentioned for fe for features as well and we will also explain how once you've altered them how you can uh, get these added to to the index that we build of the existing templates and features and once once it's once your template is in the index we will then also show it in our ui so others can can uh, make use of it okay awesome so basically um whatever you know templates or features they might be wanting they can help contribute to this if they don't already have that in their list yes so okay. that's that's a, like a, a community uh, ecosystem that we we've, we've basically started uh, yes i love that opening this up yeah we, we love opening that up um and that one more time is that containers.dev site is where people want to go for kind of that landing page of information right yes that's containers.dev that's okay. where you would awesome. start um, so someone, this is kind of a specific question, but how can I use this for game dev or building desktop apps? Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about, you know, kind of the flexibility of dev containers in general. Yeah. So you, well, you basically, you can always build your own, right. But, um, I'd say game dev and, and especially desktop apps are maybe, um, the slightly 
more difficult ones to reach because you, you want to, depending on what the UI is, if you want to have a desktop UI, what, we, what we've done in the past is, for example, use an X server to, to serve up the UI application because the, the application will end up running in this container, which, which is uh, based on Linux. So, but we have done that and, and it's certainly possible to even run an entire desktop inside the container. Awesome. So Tui, thank you for your question. Definitely lots of potential there. Um, try it out. Let us know how it goes. Um, always looking for ways to improve the whole process. All right. Well, thank you so much, Christoph. Is there anything else you want to chat about for the future of dev containers and what's in the roadmap? Yeah, let me think. We'll, I think we'll, we'll continue on, on what we've already um, done and what I've outlined here, like we'll, we'll um, make more use of the, the configuration that we can put on on uh, base images and also start using that, for example, when you attach to a, an existing container and that container might well uh, run inside Kubernetes for which we, we, we are continuing to look for, for, uh, for improvements but because we don't have like first level support at the moment. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Everyone definitely try out dev containers. I love dev containers. They are so powerful. Um, let us know what you think about them and feel free to start making your own templates and features and contributing how um, Christoph just mentioned. Thank you, Christoph. Thanks. Thanks, Olivia. All right. So our next and final feature that we will be showing will be demoed by Tyler. So Tyler, how's it going? Hello. How are you doing today? How's it going? Good. Excited to have, have you uh, here. Let's see. There we go. Can I hear you now? <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Sorry, I, muted, I like muted everything. I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to hear anything. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, Perfect. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> what are you gonna be talking about today? Yeah, I'm gonna be talking about um, this new API that we introduced last month uh, around localization of of VS Code extensions. So this is less about like you know your typical user of VS Code and more about um, extension authors uh, of, of the VS Code ecosystem. So, okay, cool. Um, so yeah. We have some love for you, actually. I just want to kick things off. <laughs> Holler, woo, hi, <hype> machine. <laughs> hey, Justin, how's so it going? So got some fans in the chat, it would seem. <laughs> All right. Cool. So, on your screen. Yeah, let me know when it's up. I've switched to a different Yeah, chat. no, you're all good. Cool. All right, so um, for those of you who don't know, this is a an outline of all the different VS Code APIs um, that we have available, which you can just get on our website. Um, I want to talk about this new section here called uh, L10N. Uh, L10N is an abbreviation for localization. Um, that's that's what the, the 10 is. Localization is a 10-letter 10, 10 word, um, which is why, like, if you've ever seen, like, Ally A11Y accessibility, um, it's just an abbreviation. I learned that uh, for the anyway. first time last week. I did not know. I was like, what is this? And then someone, like, it was on a slide, and then someone said accessibility, and I was like, whoa, that makes so much more sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, once you know, it's like, yeah, okay. I, yeah. I totally see what they're doing there. But, um, but yeah, that's that's what, what L10 is here. Um, so, uh, actually, I should say that uh, VS Code extensions have had... Uh, a localization concept for for quite a while now. Uh, it was a like a node module that you would bring into your extension called VS Code NLS, um, and it was it was great in a world where uh, you know extensions only ran uh, in like for a desktop app um, and weren't really thinking about like this new world of of the web that we have. Um, and uh, they worked really well when we had like a file system that we could easily access. But um, we've hit some some snags in the the localization of the past, and so we've kind of rethought about the problem a bit, and uh, and ended up with this particular API. And I'm just going to kind of walk through an extension of of an extension that is using this API. Um, and show you some of the neat tooling around uh, around localization that we have available. And so, I guess I should say that, like, I should probably define what localization really means, in case anybody doesn't know what that means. Um, so, localization, maybe you've heard, 
internationalization or IATN um, and translation. The, the, the overall concept is that you are providing uh, a version of your extension that is uh, localized for a particular, uh, a particular other language than, than maybe one you speak, right? So, um, so that way you could support, you know, Chinese or German or French or whatever, whatever you want to, to decide to choose. And so the, the API that we have here is to, to assist in uh, providing that kind of translation. And, and we're, we aren't like providing the, the services to do the translations for you, but at least the, the foundation for, uh, for like working with translations that you would need to then go and translate. And I oh, yeah. promise <laughs> this will make a lot more sense when we go through the demo, <laughs> but um, I just want, we're not even gonna look at these at these docs here, I'm just showing you. If you wanna look at them later, they're here. Cool. Um, I should say, before we go into the demo, uh, what languages are officially supported by, by VS Code today? Um, and that one, we jump over here to the VS Code lock repository. These contain what are called language packs. And these, you can, uh, you can install, install them through the uh, uh, extension marketplace uh, on, on desktop, or you can, uh, you can set your language uh, to you know, a different language using a command called configure display uh, language, which I will run when we go through it. But this tells you all the different languages that we like officially support. We like actually pay people at Microsoft to go and like translate all the strings of VS Code and Ooh. VS Code extensions um, to like th these languages listed here. So Okay, yeah. so these and, languages are kind of the ones that we've already invested in from our side to make sure right. that they're accurate translations. Right, yeah. There are ways to add like additional languages, but it does like, unfortunately requires a lot of work right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm the person to like streamline that and make that easier. So I, I promise I will, I, it's it's in my it's in my mind to, to work on that. But for the time being, mm -hmm. these are the, the 14 core languages, I guess, if you don't include English, 13 core languages that you, uh, can really easily support uh, in your extension. Cool, you know, this is awesome because I know we usually have a lot of people from all over the world in the chat. So um, I think that this is just a great step in kind of showing that yeah. we do want to have as much support for people all over the world, no matter what language you speak. Yeah, so uh, I guess without further ado, let me go over to my uh, to the sample here. Um, the sample I'm, I'm showing you is actually a sample from our extension samples repository. Okay. Um, and if you just scroll down, there's just like so many, so many samples here, but there's an L10N sample right there. Um, and so that's pretty much coming from here. The only thing I, I changed a couple of things, like basically some little, uh, version updates that I need to push to this repository, but it's basically what you see here will be what, what is, what is shown there okay. when you look at it later. Um, <clears throat> right. So. Without further ado, um, let's let's get into it. So I'm going to open up the extension.ts file. When you uh, you know when you make an extension for the first time using our uh, Yelman generator, you like type yo code. Uh, it'll bootstrap a lot of a lot of the normal extensiony stuff, and this is one of the things that it'll bootstrap is like having an activate function, and this is the code that runs when your extension is uh, activated in VS Code, and so. Um, where the magic comes in for localization is uh, we start right here, um, where we use this particular API, VS Code L10N dot T, um, and I promise the T does not stand for Tyler; it stands for Translate. Um, <laughs> Likely story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> um, but anyway, what this is saying is that this is basically marking this particular string as a string that you want to to translate later on. Um, and, you know, there's a couple other use cases of this. Um, so for example, uh, let's see, what else is this doing? So this is executing a task. Yeah, um, we'll get into this part later. Uh, here's another example of, uh, of another string here, hello, and then there's this syntax here. If, if, if you, if any of you are familiar with like other localization libraries, this is a kind of common pattern where you see these like placeholders, these templates here, um, and then done at 
at runtime when your extension is actually running gets replaced with whatever is inside of here, okay. um, right? And so, um, you know, you notice this isn't wrapped in a T function, mm -hmm. so that's going to stay in English. Okay. Um, and then the other thing we have this like say by command. If we go over here. Um, I separated this out because I wanted to show like kind of the other way that you can import this as well, which is to just grab the L10N namespace, which looks a little bit cleaner in my opinion than saying like VS code dot L10N dot T. It's like kind of long, but um, anyway, you see a couple couple more here, um, which is totally fine. Uh, and then the other example here is this thing we skipped over, which is this this task. Um, and so uh, this namespace here is available inside of an extension, but not every extension, not some extensions have things that exist outside of the actual extension host. They might have like some kind of CLI that they that they run in addition to the extension. And that CLI isn't going to necessarily run inside of the extension, which means that it wouldn't necessarily have access to, uh, to this, mm -hmm. right? This VS code uh, package, right? Mm -hmm. And so to, um, to support that scenario, we, we have this other package that you can install called, uh, called uh, this one here, at VS code slash L10N. And so if I go over to CLI.ts, I can see myself pulling in that package instead. Okay. Right? And then it's the same API, just like this. And the only difference is that you need to configure uh, the CLI to grab the the strings from somewhere. Okay. So that way um, it actually knows what it should be in. Okay. Exactly. And so in this case, you see I'm using uh, FSPath here, and we grab it from the from the environment variables. and. How that works is go back over here to our actual extension. Um, we can see that uh, we go ahead and grab the this this other API called VS Code L ten N URI, um, and that actually will give us a file path to the to the like bundle of of strings that we can easily just like throw over to another CLI and have that. Okay, so it's basically like, here's the translated strings. They're in this yeah. nice little bundle. Toss it over the fence to whatever this outside exactly. thing you're running with your extension. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so that's that's like another scenario. I don't think a lot of people will be in that boat because a lot of people do write extensions that that solely run in the extension uh, process, extension host, but. Just to call it out, since it's sitting here in the code, yeah, absolutely. Um, that that's that that's a possibility. So, mm -hmm. um, let's go through the different scenarios here. So, if I hit F five here um, to go ahead and run this extension, um, <clears throat> and while that's running, um, one quick question: sure. What's your theme that you're using? Oh, this is the oh, this is the panda theme. Hang on, I'm going to see if I can show you what this looks like. Panda, where is the panda? It's pretty funny. This <laughs> aspect ratio is just so <laughs> freaking funny. Um, I was hoping to find it before. We're getting oh. close. Oh, it was so <laughs> it was, yeah, I was right hoping to find there it when it switched over. <laughs> yeah, before that happens, I think I I got it here. Yeah, we're there. Panda <laughs> theme. Look at it. Isn't that cute? Uh, yeah. That's, um, that's exactly what Board Human said. Looks so cute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, right. Um, back to our sample here. Actually, where did I go? There it is. Um, so this is my extension. It has two commands, hello and goodbye. And of course, um, this is kind of the, the, the base case here, where if I do hello, it's in English. Mm -hmm. Not a very exciting demo because it's exactly what you expected since I'm not running in a different language. Mm -hmm. However, let's go ahead and run in a different language. So um, I wanted to show you, I have already a 
couple of uh, translations here for, for Japanese um, like this. And these are actually sitting in this, this L10N folder. Okay. Um, and I'll show you how I create those in a second, but just to kind of like prove that the demo, the demo works, um, I can run this again. Uh, actually, sorry, I forgot to change my display language to Japanese. Now I'll be honest with you, I do not speak Japanese. So, um, so the, doing these kinds of demos is kind of tough on me because <laughs> I, I uh, you know, visually I kind of know where this stuff is, mm -hmm. but I can't read any of it. So, um, you if know, we have anyone who speaks Japanese in the chat, they're going to be roasting, know if we're doing things right, <laughs> roasting my translation. Yeah. Right here. <laughs> so, um, I'll just let let Webpack take its time here. There we go. So. I switched over to, to Japanese in, uh, in VS Code. And so now when I run my extension uh, and then I run that hello again, we can already see that we have okay. a couple of translations here um, for hello and bye. And then if I do this, then we can see that those okay. are, are properly translated. Cool. OK, so this so, is all like pretty new to me. So just to kind of like recapture what all you did. So basically, you have that bundle file that specifies what your strings need to be translated to yeah in your actual program you then use the translate function of the api to translate mm -hmm. whatever word it in in this case hello or bye right. and right. then that's all you need to do and then when you change vs code's language to whatever it is it will say oh this is in japanese that translation now needs to go to japanese Right. And what do how do I know what to translate to? I look at the bundles. Right. Exactly. Correct? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. You you got it. Um, let me go ahead and change back to, to English here to for my own uh, sanity. <laughs> we got some feedback. They said that Japanese translation needs some work, but it looks pretty good. Okay. So there well, you look, go. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna have to blame Copilot on that one because I just did this. I did hello in Japanese. And then, ah. and then it just kind of like gave me this. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> nice. so that's that's how I did my translations. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> anyway, um, so of course now you might be wondering, like how, like what's, like crafting these JSON files seems like kind of tedious. Right. Uh, like what can I do instead, uh, or like how can I easily do that? And so that brings in this other library that we have which is called um, l10n-dev. And so I'm going to go ahead and run this command. Please ignore the preview. <laughs> um, so this command, what I'm about to run here, is uh, this is a node library that we have uh, and also a CLI that kind of helps in working with all these translation files. Um, and so you saw all of my strings that were just kind of sitting in my source code. And so step one of that is we need to get those out of there and into a, a proper bundle JSON file. And so that's what this first command does. So if I run this, what this is saying is, uh, take a look at the source folder. So, you know, all my TypeScript, and then put the result of that inside of this folder, this L10. Okay, where your bundles folder. are. Yeah, which is uh, where I've decided to put my bundles. Okay. So, you know, it says, okay, I found a few TypeScript files, and then it's writing those to a bundle.l10n.json. Okay. So if we open that up, then we can see um, that we can see our, our translations there. And we use the, the like English version as the as the key, um, and then we get whatever the translated version is. So this is only just exporting the English strings, and so um, you know we're lucky at Microsoft because we basically take this, we throw it over to these translators, and then they come back with uh, with strings for us. But not everybody has that luxury. Um, so like what I recommend is. Uh, you go ahead and take like the contents of this, and then you uh, and then get rid of this one actually. 
Um, you take the contents of this and then rename it to the language that you want to support. So like German in this case. Um, and then at this point, like it's okay that like some of the strings are in English, like it's a very iterative process, but mm -hmm. you know, I know a little bit of German to say that see you later is, uh, is Spader, which of course Copilot helps me out. Um, <clears throat> And so, you know, I just did this one translation and I can go ahead and check this into my repository um, so that German speakers around the world can take a look to see what still needs to be translated if they want to help me out with my extension. Okay. Um, and then they can contribute kind of as we go along. And so then if I go ahead and change the language to German, um, and then run the extension again. In the fullness of time. Okay, so while this is going, yeah. yeah. So basically, because I mean, obviously extension authors, they already have existing extensions. They don't want to have to rework this. So really running that command that you showed on the, on the terminal, that's going to be able to basically extract anything that they would need to translate if they want to translate it. And so then from there, they can then iteratively, iteratively build from that and translate. Right. However, so they're their translations. Okay. I can do hello. Obviously, it's still in English, but then I can do bye and then see that this one is okay. Entering. So cool. <clears throat> um, the message really I'm trying to like sell here is that like it's okay to be iterative in, mm -hmm. in your localization um, stuff because. I mean, like some translations is better than none at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's all like fine and dandy, but sometimes, uh, sometimes you want to like play around with translations without having to know another language. Um, I don't know an another language know. other than English. I don't English, either. Unfortunately, I, wish I, could. I know. Yeah, I wish I did too. <laughs> but um, so another like interesting tool that we have within this API is um, generating pseudo language. Um, so pseudo language is this concept or pseudo localization is this concept of like taking English strings and then replacing characters in those English strings with, uh, with like special characters. So like an, an A in, uh, I was hoping that there would be something with an A, but anyway, uh, and some A in, in an English word would get replaced with like the A uh, with umlaut, right? Okay. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> with this command, I can mark files that I want to pseudo languageify. So I've done this one and uh, we'll talk about that one in, in, a, in a second, but I can go ahead and write that out. And then I now have this, which looks really funny, but at least you as an English speaker can read, you know, what is actually going on here. Mm -hmm. And so then if I change my language to pseudo language, which is this one, <clears throat> and I restart VS Code for like the 50th time <laughs> in this presentation, and then I run that, you can kind of guess what, what's going to happen, but that will that will show up in the in the pseudo language. Cool. So is that usually what you use like to test since you don't know other languages? Do you use that pseudo language to kind of make sure it's working? Yeah, honestly, I uh, <laughs> I always have VS Code in, in pseudo language. Oh, really? um, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I own all the localization for VS Code. Uh -huh. so, um, so for me, it's like it's not a big deal. Right. And I get to like I don't know, dog food my own work, right? uh -huh. which is fun. So that's that's that. And then this has been kind of a whirlwind of localization. <clears throat> the last thing I want to talk about is um, is not really <clears throat> that API related, but um, I wanted to talk about strings that you might have in your in your package.json. So normally, when you like contribute a command, uh, you give it like a title. And you can see I already have something odd here that doesn't quite look right, you would expect it to say like, hello. But I have what's what uh, this like key here, extensions dot say hello dot title. And this is actually get this gets pulled out of 
a package.nls.json file, which is next to it. And this has actually existed for quite a while, but, um, and you can see very similarly to the bundle file I showed you earlier, you have like hello in here. And then if you look at other files I have here, we've got the, the QPS block one, that's a pseudo language one. You can see that we have hello and bye, and then the Japanese one as well. So and when, when you uh, say it pulls it out of the regular package JSON to the package us, is that automatic? Did you run a command to get that to happen? Yeah, so using the pseudo language as an example, <clears throat> For extension authors, like we know that this title here means that it's going to be displayed uh, in. Oh, I've lost it. <laughs> Not easy to switch between those two. Yeah. Um, uh, we know that that title is what gets displayed in the command palette mm -hmm. here, right? And so VS Code knows that if there's a <clears throat> if there's a uh, like percent thing okay. percent here when we read the extensions package.json mm -hmm. when it gets loaded that we will first try to resolve you know in the language of choice which in this case is the pseudo language and if not it'll fall back to um to the normal english strings okay <clears throat> and that also applies to the bundle itself like you know i if uh, for the German one, like I could really just delete all of these that aren't in German. And then, you know, VS Code will do a good job of saying, okay, I have a translation for this one, but I don't have it for the other ones. So I'm just going to use what was actually uh, okay. written right in the source code. The default. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So this was a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> this was so cool though. I feel like I learned so much. <laughs> This is kind of like, you know, a really high level, but also at the same time, pretty in-depth look of uh, supporting localization in, in an extension. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think localization is super important. I, I put it up there along with accessibility mm -hmm. because, you know, if somebody <clears throat> on the other side of the world who doesn't speak English can't use your product, um, then that's, you know, that's kind of a missed opportunity, right? Um, Absolutely, yeah. I think and, it, it definitely shows that we want to be as inclusive as possible. Right. And, you know, we're, of course, spoiled because we have systems in place mm -hmm. um, to, to translate these things. But, you know, Microsoft works globally. So it's like for Microsoft, translation is kind of like <clears throat> a given, right? It's like mm -hmm. it's an expectation, right? Um, but for any old extension, like, that wants to maybe have global customers, um, global users, like I would highly, highly encourage trying to take advantage of something like this um, and seeing if you can, you can help out, if, if, seeing if you can help out other extensions um, if you do speak another language to, uh, to help them uh, get onto localiz localizing their, their extensions. So absolutely. Cool. That's my cool. spiel. That was amazing. I learned so much. <laughs> Um, we had some love in here. So Alessandro said, congrats for the API, already planning to support on all of my extensions. So we love to hear that. Um, definitely Thank let you. us know how it goes. Um, just kind of taking like one step outside of the, the extension piece, just localization in general. If people are going through and using these different language packs in VS Code and they notice that a translation is wrong, is there somewhere they can file that issue? Yeah, good question. Um... So it's uh, it does depend on uh, like what translation is wrong, like who owns that translation. I'd say like generally, um, if it's something that's kind of core to VS Code, you're gonna want to go over here to the VS Code lock repository and file an issue there. And then this this actually this repository is um, uh, like the localization team at Microsoft like has access to this repo and they yeah. like they uh, handle the issues accordingly. And if you have a better suggestion for a particular string, um, they're the ones that can go and like make the proper change uh, on the back end so that like future versions of the of the language pack can have that fix. Okay. Um, 
if it's a string that has to do with a particular extension, let's say like the GitHub pull request extension, um, then file that on the GitHub pull request extension and we'll make sure it gets back to the to the right people to uh, to make that change. Okay, um, cool. That makes sense. So basically yeah. if it's one of the core languages in VS Code in general, go to this yeah. that you have on your screen, but otherwise go to the particular extensions repo. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Um, one thing I forgot to mention that is like kind of crucial for all of this to, to play uh, together. Um, when we wanted to, to make this change, we wanted to, to do it with, uh, with the web in mind. Um, and how localization worked previously is that it was doing a lot of like searching the file system to try to find where the bundle was. But we said, okay, this is, that's too complicated. And in the web, we don't have like really a file system to like start scanning around for. Right. Um, <clears throat> so we wanted to be super explicit with these, with these changes. And so one, uh, you, you notice that like all of my bundles were in this L10N folder. <clears throat> and that was intentional because I have here in my package.json a property called L10N um, and it's mapped to that specific folder. And what that says to to VS Code is all of the all of the bundles for my strings are located in that folder, and that's where you should look. Okay. Um, that's where you should try to load uh, bundles from, um, and that will work both on the desktop and on the web as well okay. if you have a localized uh, extension. Cool. So that that's like super important. So if you if you're like going through this and you're like, why aren't any of my translations showing up? I got the files in the right place. Uh, it might be that you that you just needed to add add this. And okay. uh, I, I call this out of like needing this in the in the sample in the the docs which are in uh, this VS Code L10N repository. Um, I call it out in a few places, so I'm hoping that <laughs> those going through it don't yeah. don't miss that detail. But um, but yeah, I, I do want to call that out. It's, okay. uh, it's maybe a little unusual, but cool. yeah. So hopefully y'all don't miss that. But if you do and you want to try out this sample, um, this live stream is going to be posted on our YouTube channel, so you can just rewatch this back um, and hear Tyler say it for himself. That's right. Um, yeah. To not forget <laughs> that. <laughs> cool. So. All right, let's see if we have any questions here. Um, we have one little language joke. You could say developers know many languages. We communicate in multiple different languages with VS Code every day. Very true. That's um, right. We had some more questions about the theme. People love your theme, Tyler, <laughs> the panda theme. Oh, I got to show you the best part of this panda theme, which is the, the diagram at the bottom of it, which is just hilarious. Um, why am I just so bad? <laughs> okay. Can I scroll here? It's a little hard to see because I'm so zoomed in, but let me you can, yeah, you can zoom, zoom out for now, just yeah. a minute, right? <laughs> so I love at the very bottom of it, it has um, about pandas and uh, it's just this like art with these pandas on it and some fun facts about pandas. Oh, I love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I love it. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> shout out to uh, where's the publisher? Anyway, shout out to the <laughs> to the panda theme folks. It's great. Someone said it's a party. It's a party. Yes, that panda theme makes it the party. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Cool. And I think I scrolled through, but someone said, okay, here we go. Um, is that update available for us? Um, everything we've demoed in today's release party is an update that is available. Um, VS Code should update automatically. Um, and then mm -hmm. Tyler, I don't know if you just want to speak to getting the updated APIs, if that will just automatically happen as well, if you're an extension author. Yeah. If you, if you want to use this, you need to use uh, the engine version, at least 1.73 and grab the 1.73 types, this one, okay. to make sure that you see the, the new API. Cool. But yeah, it's it's finalized. So like as of 1.73, um, you can use it freely as you so choose. Awesome. Yeah. OK, well, thank you so much, Tyler. Is there any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Uh, I don't think so. Translate yeah. your extensions. And yeah. uh, oh, I guess I will ask this for the general community. I mean, 
I mentioned that like, you know, we have our own system here in Microsoft for translations, but uh, if you find some tool that's like more readily available for like, for a community around like managing translations or like, like computing translations for you, um, like let us know. Cause I, I would love to uh, call out these things in, in documentation so that uh, other folks can like easily translate their extensions. So. Absolutely. Um, yeah. That's a great call out. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Tyler. We're excited to see where else this localization will go and how it gets picked up by all the extension authors. It's really great work and it's very important. I know um, I skipped through a couple, but I know while we were talking about this, someone said hello from Italy, right? We have people all over. So this is very applicable. Sure, no. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll see you again on a future release party then, Tyler. Sounds thank good. You. Thanks for having me. Of course, anytime. All right. So to all our viewers here, thank you so much for joining. It was another fun release party. We will be back in December for our final release party of the year. Um, thank you for watching. Again, like I said, this live stream will be available on our YouTube channel after, so you can watch back all the cool features we did and see the interaction we had. So make sure to follow us on our YouTube channel, which is up on our screen for that link. Um, and then we're also on TikTok. So feel free to give us a follow there if you want to just see some shorts that we post every week um, featuring different tips and tricks with VS Code some happenings. We do promos for our live streams there, lots of good stuff there. So make sure to give us a follow. Last but not least, thank you to our presenters for coming on today. We love having you on. It's a great time to get the public to actually get to chat with engineers and see the features that they love so dearly. So thank you all. And we will see you next week for another live stream and next month for another release party.